Uh, the session will consider how multilateral institutions, governments, civil society, and private sector can work together for common sustainable development goals. Before we start the proceedings of the today's panel discussion, I would like to list down a few ground rules for our esteemed panelists and attendees who are joining us online. Uh, kindly keep your microphone off when not speaking to avoid distortion. Kindly keep your cameras on if your internet bandwidth allows. The attendees may like to put the question in the Q&A section. If time permits, we might be able to allow a few questions towards the end of the session. And with your permission, the meeting is being recorded and going live on Facebook and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, before we start off the panel discussion, I would like to introduce our moderator for the session, uh, who is Ms. Huma Fakhar, a CEO and founder of MAP Capital and Sultana Rice. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's, it's good. Asalaamu Alaikum and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very warm welcome to our speakers joining in online and uh, present here in person. I'd like to start by congratulating SDPI for yet another very successful event. Um, I'd also like to congratulate ITC, Dr. Thakir and his team. They've put a spectacular panel together here. Uh, joining in online and in person here. Um, international trade, um, as an exporter, I can tell you, international trade is the business card for a country. Where primarily when we go out to market our goods, we go out to market our country, that is how the world gets to know what we are aspiring for. Considering that uh, trade openness divides what exactly the country is going to be, what mode or what path the country is going to be taking. When we look at Pakistan, sadly, our trade openness is as low as 138 out of 144. Now, what does that mean? That means that our capacity to innovate is less, our capacity to produce more is less, our capacity to in short take care and invest in our people is less because we are closed. Uh, as a result, we've just remained a textile exporter and that too um, of very low value added products. We could never go into high ended and we remained at that bottom pit. On the other hand, we see our competitors, especially in the textile sector. Vietnam grew by 120%. India grew by 36%. Uh, Sri Lanka grew by 24%. And where is Pakistan? And I'm giving you figures 2019. I'm excluding the last two years because that's been a dis disruptive uh, period. Pakistan was minus 11. Now, how did that happen? How have we landed here when others in the region have grown tremendously and we've slid back by my minus 11? Sadly, we have deindustrialized rather prematurely. And the two reasons I personally feel for this deindustrialization, first, the larger national environment of our country has been a bit harsh. So if we step back a few decades, starting from, say, nationalization and then Afghan war and then uh, war on terrorism and then, you know, all those travel advisories, buyers leaving Pakistan, so on and so forth, the image never helped us to market our products. And the second most important reason, which I feel, while this was on the image side, one key reason why we could not grow in our exports the way our potential is, is FDI. FDI did come into Pakistan, but that was mostly in the FMCG section. The investors came to benefit from our demographic dividend. They never came in the export sector. And the only example, one model that we need to follow, which has been uh, a country which was, say, about 40 years back, 50% behind in GDP than ours, Vietnam. Uh, the sole uh, agenda that Vietnam picked up was investment in the uh, export-oriented industry. 70% investment of Vietnam is in the export-oriented in, uh, industry. Just a little example, 2019, in one year, Vietnam got almost a $2 billion investment in its textiles, 184 projects, and all these 184 projects are spread across just three cities, which means 
not that the text the money goes to the textile mill it means that the money goes into design houses into skill development into roads into schools into technology parks and they've spread it as a prosperity methodology rather than just an investment in a mill and this is exactly what never happened in pakistan and we remained far behind while we were struggling somewhere there trying to see if we can improve ourselves covid hit that's 2020 and as a result of covid uh, there was some good news for us and this good news was pakistani exporters jumped to the occasion we've done a bit of uh, taking the market share it is not permanent we do not know if it is permanent as yet but this our market share are supporting us in our market share because our exporters jumped into sectors that the occasion needed whether it was masks whether it was medical bed sheets etc cetera, etc cetera. and my big question to the panel and this is what this panel would be discussing here today is suddenly we see there is a dynamism in the export sector will this be continued how can our multilateral organizations help us how can our bilateral partners and donors help us and how can a government jump on at this time even in the face of a high sovereign debt and create an environment which is legitimately sustainable and uh, create an opportunity for the country's exporters to go forward there are many other things that would be discussed but uh, due to shortage of time we'll we'll continue uh, discussing it with our panelists um before we go into our panel discussions i'd like to request dr taqir to please kindly uh, give his opening remarks dr taqir is the national project coordinator of uh, itc remit revenue mobilization investment and trade um it, the project is funded by fcdo he has served as pakistan's ambassador to the wto in geneva and is a civil servant with over 30 years experience dr taqir please thank you excellencies distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen since it's a hybrid session good morning good afternoon and good evening on behalf of international trade center and sdpi i welcome all of you to this very important session whether you are joining us remotely or here in islamabad we are pleased that you could join us sdpi's sustainable development conference is an important event on our national development debate calendar this conference is a space that brings together diverse global and national voices and gives them a platform to share their perspectives experiences and concerns on issues being faced by people and the planet the conference overarching theme beyond the pandemic leaving no one behind is very close to itc's mandate and mission that's why we requested sdpi to include a session on how inclusive trade and investment can help build back better we are grateful to sdpi for agreeing to our suggestion we are glad that we have among us today the federal secretaries from the government of pakistan responsible for public policy on trade and investment our profound thanks to global thought leaders from trade hub in europe who have joined us today ddg wto chen chen zhang my dear friend from china he was china's ambassador uh, before he took up this responsibility in the wto a great friend of pakistan Dr. Marian from OECD and Dr. Said from ITC Geneva will share with us their perspectives on multilateral approach to inclusive trade and COVID-19 challenges, green growth, and how SMEs can support in our efforts to ensure inclusive recovery. We have Mike, Deputy British High Commissioner, to share with us development partners' perspective on role of trade-related technical assistance. in post covid economic recovery ladies and gentlemen this meeting is important to exchange views on our joint work and ensure that we use our mutual strengths and efforts for common objective of inclusive growth itc through fcdo supported multi year program called remit is providing technical support to mainstream trade and sme development into national development planning and discourse and we are doing this in partnership with 
Ministry of Commerce and its allied agencies. ITC work on ground to enhance the capacity of SMs, SMEs in the developing and least developing countries to engage in international trade. Our work helps to develop confidence on businesses in member countries in the rule-based multilateral trade system. ITC work demonstrates an in-depth understanding of the link between SME competitiveness and its role in increasing, creating a more inclusive and sustainable economy. ITC works in 128 developing and LDC member countries, and its work is a valuable contribution to our shared efforts to achieve SDGs in Global South. We support ITC's core constituency of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises to give them a voice in global trade and to engage in public-private dialogues in their own countries, in their regions, and around the world. ITC was among the first multilateral institutions to analyze the impact of pandemic on SMEs through its COVID-19 business impact survey. Ladies and gentlemen, things are bad out there. People are really suffering. We know that COVID has unleashed a human development crisis of almost unimaginable proportions. An economic crisis with the largest drop in activity since the Great Depression and global GDP falling by nearly 4% last year. Millions of jobs and livelihoods lost, particularly in the developing countries. A health crisis with millions gone and millions more sick. An education crisis whose impact will be felt for years to come. A hidden pandemic of worsening social inequality. Ladies and gentlemen, women-led SMEs have been especially hard hit, with many reporting revenue losses of over 50%, largely due to their smallest size, informality, and concentration in heavily affected sectors. Our research at International Trade Center shows that one in every five micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises is at the risk of shutting down permanently within weeks or months. COVID has had an enormous impact on trade over the last year. We all know the statistics, but some are worth repeating. We witnessed the largest ever single period decline in global trade during year 2020. More than 80 countries impose restrictions or prohibitions on trade. A massive shock to global shipping with freight indices increasing fivefold. Services trade falling by more than 20%, almost four times the decline in goods trade. More than 500 million jobs have been lost. Investment has contracted and we see poverty rising for the first time in this century over 130 million new people are projected to have fallen below the poverty line in year 2020. The progress on all the UN global goals has been affected and there has been 15% increase in global public debt. Ladies and gentlemen, in a recent UNCTAD report, the scope of inequalities in the response to the crisis has been laid bare. There has been a worldwide investment of 12.7 trillion US dollars, physical stimulus that different economies gave uh, to, to their countries gave to their economy. But for every per capita $1 stimulus spent in the LDCs, the developed countries have spent $580, one to 580. There can be no starker statistic than this. Ladies and gentlemen, when trade suffers, people suffer, countries suffer, jobs are lost, government revenues decline, spending drops, and enterprises shut down. In this scenario, we all want the same thing, employment opportunities for our citizens to raise their quality of life. Trade remains one of the surest ways to get there. And in ITC, we firmly believe in this. Fortunately, we are now seeing trade volumes begin to bounce back, but like so many trends in COVID, there is a worrying inequality behind the aggregate statistics that must concern us all. 
there is a clear K-shaped recovery where the small and poor are lagging behind. The recovery in exports we see for so many large countries is simply not there for everyone. Financial institutions around the world warn that we are heading towards a protracted K-shaped recovery. While many developed countries can entertain the idea of post-pandemic recovery, many developing countries are entering their third and fourth waves, and now Omicron. It is predicted that technology-driven and large firms will see the greatest gains for recovery, while many small businesses will be slower to recover. Please make no mistake, an unequal recovery can and will further worsen existing inequalities. Ladies and gentlemen, pandemic has had a devastating impact on investment. Foreign direct investment in developing countries have contracted up to 40% in year 2020. The continued closure of borders into 2021 and with this new uh, epidemiological crisis of Omicron, there is a risk that we will further exacerbate this situation. Revitalizing investment flows is fundamental to recovery of developing countries' economy. And investment facilitation will be critical to promoting greater value addition and industrialization. We will explore the critical connection between trade and investment in today's session. Colleagues, ITC believes SMEs are the engines of employment and generate most jobs for youth, women, and vulnerable communities. They play an integral role in holding our societies together. They are catalysts for inclusive growth and development. The pandemic confirmed that multilateral problems and global crises need multilateral solutions. When that doesn't happen, we have vaccine nationalism. We have the revving inequalities between and within countries. And we have global value chains that don't work for the less developed countries. Let me share an interesting fact from Geneva Global Trade Hub. Presently, it is run for the first time in history by three women from developing countries. All key members of Trade Hub in Geneva, ONCTAD, WTO, and ITC are presently headed by women from developing countries. This gives growth, great hope to billions in the global south. I think the reason many of us entered the international trade field is that we went, wanted betterment for our communities. We wanted to fix global inequalities. We wanted enhanced economic opportunities for those in need. So as we come here today to discuss how we can enhance resilience for the future, we must have a clear picture of who we truly work for and what we strive for. I know I'm in good company when I say that micro, small, and medium enterprises are the backbone of our economy. They account for 90% of the businesses and over 60% of employment in most country economies. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot afford to leave small businesses behind. How do we empower small firms, especially those owned by women and youth, to become more resilient in our national and global economies? This will be our key question to all speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Um, when we see when SARS came over, now some 19 years back, China was hardly 4% of the global GDP. When COVID came over, when COVID took over two years back and it ravaged the world, it was 16% of the GDP. So, when the world's factory, which is China, stopped during COVID, the supply chain disruption was um, utterly uh, something that world had not experienced. US had no ketchup, UK had no carbonated water, uh, Australia had no timber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in all this scenario, as I said uh, earlier, Pakistan did jump up to the occasion and we did manage to increase some of export of some of our products that the world was needing. 
and it came up in a very short time on the uh, what was needed and it just uh, managed to export which others uh, were not managing to export and were losing ground at which meant we did manage to get a market share, which we did not have before. My question is, will this kind of momentum continue? What does the panel see, and especially Secretary Saab, this uh, question to yourself, please. What do you see? How can the businesses be supported uh, to maintain this kind of export level? And where do you see it is all headed? Um, for the opening remarks uh, overall, and to address the post-COVID direction, I would now request uh, Secretary Government of Pakistan for Ministry of Commerce, Mr. Mohammad Sauleh Ahmed Farooqi. Uh, Mr. Farooqi is an uh, officer of Pakistan Administration Services. Before joining as Secretary, he has remained posted as Secretary TDAP, and he has had many several other high positions, including Executive Officer of Sindh Infrastructure Development Company. Sir, if you could. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. And uh, as one of our friends uh, said that, good evening or good morning, whichever is applicable, wherever. Uh, I thank ITC and the Sustainable Development Policy Institute for inviting me to SDPI's uh, 24th Sustainable Development Conference on Building Back Better, a Roadmap for Sustainable and Inclusive Trade and Investment. Let me acknowledge the services of our developmental partners partner organizations, which over a considerable course of time have lent a very supportive hand to the government in spearheading and executing policy formulation and related interventions. Here I would like to thank International Trade Center uh, with great involvement the Ministry of Commerce on various trade facilitation initiatives to improve business environment for the country. Let me also extend my special gratitude to the distinguished panel of today's conference, Dr. Saeed, uh, the senior advisor of ITC, Dr. Sayyid Takirsha, uh, Ms. Soma Fakhar, Ms. Farina Mazhar, uh, our Secretary Board of Investment, uh, Mr. Michael Friend, uh, uh, and the Deputy High, British High Commissioner, who works very closely with uh, all constituents of the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, Ms. Marian Jensen, Director of Trade and Agriculture Directorate, OECD. Ambassador Excellency Chen Chen Zhang, uh, De Deputy DG, WTO Geneva, Dr. Vakar Ahmed, Joint Executive Director, SDPI. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 crisis, much has been said about uh, that here and it is still unfolding in many ways. It has brought to fore various challenges, issues of inequity, various vulnerabilities, a mismatch of resources and potential across the globe and within the country, distortions within and across sectors, countries, and regions. At the same time, we are witnessing new opportunities and learning new ways and means to connect and do business. Uh, during the height of crisis, government of Pakistan made sustained and a reasonable successful efforts to avert a large scale humanitarian crisis. And at the same time to ensure the continuity in economic and social domains. Last financial year was closed with an export figure of $25.3 billion, the highest ever that we achieved. From July up to now, in the current financial year, we have already crossed 13 billion uh, uh, United States dollars mark up till today. However, ladies and gentlemen, is it enough for a country with this size, population, diversity, and potential. Would the macroeconomic numbers and indicators 
will be the only vehicle to carry us forward. Let me share with you some clean ingredients and components of our new framework, which is now taking shape. What we are now trying to do or what we are trying to now achieve, let me share some good news. Whatever has been achieved in terms of growth in export, a large portion of it is connected to the value-added value products, is connected to the entry into the new markets. So in terms of product diversification and in terms of market diversification. Progress has been slow, but steady. And how now we are going to sort of consolidate these efforts to retain our share and not only retain our share, actually address the issues of scale, issues of uh, skills, issues of standards, issues of innovations, issues basically connected to the more inclusive trade uh, and investment. When we talk about the product diversification, it's not only connected to the potential that resides out of the country. It is also inherently connected to the potential which is there within the communities, within so many vulnerable groups, within the regions in the nook and corner of the country, how you protect, protect your GI. So the GI law is now in place. And now we are already working on around 90 products uh, where the list will go on and on in the near future uh, for the protection of the GIs. So uh, ranging from our Basmati to the chappals in Charsadda to the emeralds of Sawat and Doda of uh, Diai Khan and Ajrak of Sin and Tiles of Multan so that is the potential that we have to capture and that and these are the stakeholders which need to be there in our fold. Uh, a huge exercise in terms of tariff rationalization. Uh, we have been quite disconnected to the world's demand, to the demand of our industry. Uh, the policies at best have been erratic. So there has been a sustained effort in last two years where we have already touched upon more than 4,000 of tariff lines in last two years. With certain lead time, you are already witnessing the growth in large scale manufacturing. You are already witnessing uh, the growth in new sectors, either within the existing or traditional sectors or the new development sectors as we call them. Then again, trade facilitation measures in terms of use of technology, better integration and coordination, easing out border controls, development of new systems and integration with uh, our uh, within the government, outside the government, as we are now, um, if, if you are aware of uh, the single window initiative and the initiative being supported by ITC, the trade portal initiative. So a lot is being um, achieved. Uh, the, our uh, uh, colleague here, she's sitting, uh, uh, Madam Farina, uh, the BOI has taken lead uh, in terms of this regulatory gluteen uh, and I, I believe that she would be sharing some highlights that what has been achieved so far and what we are going to achieve in next few weeks and few months and over the next uh, year or two. Uh, one of uh, our uh, major goals as we have been uh, the probably the least connected region in the world. Uh, and it is unfortunate. We have lost a lot of potential. We have lost a lot of opportunities. Uh, uh, I think we are one of the few countries which has uh, the lowest trade with its neighbors. 
uh, we started uh, with the comprehensive strategy. We first uh, reached out to Uzbekistan, did our first ever tra uh, transit and trade agreement in Central Asian uh, republics. That is Uzbekistan and why Uzbekistan? Because the Uzbekistan is the one country which is connected to all other cars countries. Uh, and it has shortest distance from Pakistan. One of the key, uh, or say, few of the key principles that we embarked upon, or that we sort of uh, uh, encapsulate uh, in our strategy was secured borders, secured routes, efficient handling of cargo and shipments, bringing the cost down for the trade. And those were the key elements which has actually uh, sort of uh, 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 prompted these uh, our neighbors to actually with, work with us. Now we are already in this uh, arrangement uh, with Uzbekistan. Uh, inshallah, in, uh, end, uh, by end of December, we are going to operationalize uh, our transit and trade agreement. We are already uh, in touch and in advanced stages uh, of uh, our discussion with Kazakhstan, with Kyrgyzstan, with, with Tajikistan, with Turkmenistan. Uh, we have worked with our partners and um, in private sectors and within the government and across the borders uh, for the promotion of TIR regime. So now the so we have been uh, sort of a victim of this global uh, supply chain uh, disruption. The shipping has uh, witnessed uh, around five-fold to six-fold increase in prices and non-availability. That was high time actually that uh, the Pakistan uh, started to push for the better uh, facilitation for the TIR, TIR regime, which is the global uh, standard, and also uh, working with IRU, with TIR, and, and other such uh, organization, and also coming up with a better logistical framework uh, within the country. So we are working on our, so the new direction, even in the, the commerce's policy, uh, connected to tariff rationalization and other components is support to the logistics. Uh, for this year, what we have achieved so far is we have uh, tackled with uh, some more than half of our steel chain, um, textile chain, chemicals, and others. This year, the priority areas are logistics, agriculture, including the agro-processing, uh, the packaging, so logistics and packaging are, are the cross-cutting. The, both of these uh, components are required by all of our uh, exporters. We have uh, started uh, analyzing the government support schemes for the exports, and uh, the conclusion is very clear. These schemes uh, have worked for the country, but only for the big boys. Uh, now, for a uh, country of this size, this kind of diversity, this kind of youth bulge, and the vulnerabilities spread across how to make all of these schemes more sustainable and more friendly towards SMEs, micro enterprises, women, and other non traditional sectors. Uh, so now the new principal document, the strategic trade policy framework, is taking care of that. First, it is now diverting its attention to the other such sectors. Again, on the development for the sectoral strategies, we are thankful to the uh, International Trade Center uh, and support of the FCDO. Um, so uh, I must mention that 
and a very comprehensive uh, uh, policy framework is being developed in consultation with the stakeholders uh, spread across nook and corner of the country. So all of the schemes, whether these are the state bank finance schemes, these are the government uh, support schemes, these are now being rehashed. Uh, the trade policy framework has already been approved. Textile policy is going to the ECC in next week. Uh, E-commerce policy is already there. We are now trying, it is our, one of the key areas of concentration that e-commerce, we take it not only as a progressive tool to promote trade, but as a great equalizer. Because e-commerce then again, uh, with the minimal of the cost, connects small businesses, connects the people uh, doing business from homes, from villages, and, and across Pakistan. So that is being supported. We have uh, already witnessed a uh, great uh, increase in the domestic e-commerce. We are now in the final stages of sorting out uh, the digital payment uh, gateway solu uh, solutions for the country uh, for the promotion of the e-commerce uh, for a global trade. Uh, you must have heard about the registration, seller registration with Amazon that is again being supported across the uh, country and especially uh, uh, with an emphasis on micro enterprises, uh, women -owned, owned companies and SMEs. And it is, uh, let me share that it is not a coincidence that this is the time when this uh, new strategic trade policy framework is shaping up while uh, SME policy is being uh, finalized uh, by the federal government. Giving a clear definition to the SMEs and micro enterprises, giving a very clear and facilitative regime of financing for, uh, for those enterprises and building up the complete ecosystem. So that again, the uh, Ministry of Commerce is working very closely with Sameda and industries to uh, support this effort. Uh, again, it is one of uh, or few of our priorities that are connected to better social environment and environmental compliances. Uh, work on standards, better labs, better standards, better orientation in terms of uh, their know-how and capacity, whether these are, uh, these are our export partners or the government institutions and the private institutions responsible for the more effective IPR regime. Again, to attract uh, foreign investment, again, to support the innovation uh, within the country and to leverage the potential that is hidden. So the STPF, the Strategic Trade Policy Framework has now come up with a more inclusive governance framework. Now there is a National Export Development Board headed by the Prime Minister of Pakistan himself. And uh, besides the relevant government organizations, it has professionals and it also has uh, various uh, business sectors represented in the board. Now, again, because we thought that the board is not a panacea in itself, we must have a more inclusive framework of governance. So the, from the, uh, for the first time, now we are going to notify the sectoral councils. The sectoral councils have the clear representation or the majority representation from our various business sectors and not only best of our exporters uh, is with the special emphasis em emphasis on uh, SMEs and as well as women but the professionals associated with that uh, from all over the country so I think uh, this exercise would be completed uh, in January for uh, for almost all of the sectors Uh, 
the Ministry of Commerce is also now supporting the, uh, the complete ecosystem which is required to sustain and to promote exports. Uh, working with uh, our own uh, agencies, the government agencies, uh, like uh, uh, BOI, Pakistan Customs, FBR uh, as a whole, because there are trade-related taxes and facilitation regime that has to be addressed and uh, uh, has to be uh, conditioned further for, uh, for a better export uh, or trade uh, environment. A new uh, export facilitation scheme has been uh, unveiled by the FBR. I would request the SMEs, especially uh, uh, across the uh, country, uh, to please uh, make best use of that scheme because it has, uh, to a very large extent, has eased out various procedural and cumbersome modalities, which uh, uh, especially the smaller companies uh, had to go through because they don't have this wherewithal which uh, the larger organizations have. Uh, have. So, so that is uh, already there. So, so we believe that, uh, and we would urge uh, a very comprehensive program of dissemination of EFS is going to be unveiled soon. Um, and where we would uh, be entering into a partnership with uh, Pakistan Customs uh, and uh, Trade Development Authority of Pakistan. Uh, I've already indicated that how the remit funded by ITC, uh, the managed by ITC and uh, funded by FCDO is working towards supporting all of the major components of our strategy. And we are very thankful to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I would just say that uh, these are the challenges that we confront with. And when we talk about the more inclusive uh, framework within the country, we also look upon our development partners. We look upon especially the multilateral institutions to actually support a more sustainable and more inclusive multilateralism uh, framework. Uh, and these are the lessons learned. I have touched upon just few, I've, I've not uh, gone through the formal speech that I have, just wanted to touch upon uh, various uh, initiatives, trying to address the, the point raised by the lady that uh, what are the key uh, principles or initiatives by the government of Pakistan to sustain the momentum and to sort of uh, 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 increase those flows. Uh, so thank you very much. And with that, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saleh Saab. Was music to us uh, to hear about an SME policy um, domestic e-commerce e especially, and of course, digital payments. The future is, is what all it holds. Coming <clears throat> to another area, once COVID started to recede, um, the demand side of things jumped back, uh, but the supply did not. Um, of course, as, as the supply chains were all uh, disrupted, to give you an example of just the iPhone, iPhone in, in itself has about 43 countries input before it's put together. The box is from Czech Republic, the chip is from Taiwan, uh, the assembly is in China, et cetera, et cetera. Once COVID uh, halted all these countries and the shipments were not coming through, uh, huge issues happened, but this is just not about the iPhone. Most products in the world went through this and we jumped up um, to grab the opportunity and um, export some of the vac uh, vacuum areas that we thought the gaps to be filled in in this supply chain. I'm very honored to have our next speaker who's going to talk to us about how can the multilateral system, the multilateral organizations, help Pakistan to continue this momentum, help Pakistan to come up with a sustained uh, export and international uh, economic relations within on the world stage. 
Very honored to have Ambassador Ziang Chen Zhang with us. Uh, honored to have you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Zhang uh, is DG World Trade Organization at Geneva. Uh, he has formerly been, ser been serving as Vice Minister in the Ministry of Commerce in China. He has a long and extensive experience at WTO issues. Ambassador Zhang has also served as China's permanent representative to the WTO and as deputy permanent representative to the uh, WTO. Uh, Ambassador Zhang, very honored to have you. Over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Yume Faha, Your Excellency Secretary Mohammed uh, Salah Ahmed uh, Farouki, dear colleagues and uh, participants, it's my great pleasure to participate in this important discussion. Especially, it gave me the opportunity to see my brother and my dear friends, uh, Ambassador Toki Shah. Uh, uh, Toki, uh, I miss you in Geneva. The multilateral trading system uh, represented by the WTO has always been playing a core role in global trade rules making. However, the importance of those rules can be easily neglected by people. It's like the air we breathe every day. We cannot live without it, but uh, we often forget its existence. So that's my first uh, point. The COVID pandemic remains as the existence and the importance of WTO rules. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the WTO has been closely monitoring developments and the trends in global trade and trade policies. The research by WTO shows that WTO rules have slowed and prevented countries from taking very damaging trade restrictive measures during the pandemic. In addition, the global trading system has helped countries cope with the pandemic by facilitating access to critical medical supplies, food, and the consumer goods. The latter is particularly true for developing and least developed countries, because compared with rich countries, they are more vulnerable to crisis. That is, the WTO helps countries recover from the pandemic through the functioning of existing rules, dispute settlement mechanism, and trade policy review mechanism. Looking forward, WTO will continue to play such a fundamental and a significant role in safeguarding international trade. My second point is that WTO will help countries recover from the pandemic through making new trade rules in response to rising challenge faced by the world. You may have noted that WTO had a plan to hold its 12th ministerial conference in Geneva last week. However, due to urgent health concerns caused by the new variant of uh, COVID virus, uh, the conference was postponed at the last minutes. Both the members and the secretariat were very disappointed with the decision because we have been working day and night for several weeks in order to produce concrete outcome for the conference. If it had been held last week, we expected to harvest agreements on several negotiation areas. Satisfactorily, some of them have been announced last week. In the area of service regulation, 67 WTO members representing 90% of global service trade announced last Thursday a deal focused on licensing and the qualification of service providers. The outcome will be applied to benefit the full WTO membership. According to the WTO and OECD research, this deal will save business, especially small business, 150 billion US dollars annually in costs. On investment, significant progress has been achieved in developing agreement on investment facilitation for development which aims to create clear and constant global benchmark for investment facilitation, reducing regulatory uncertainty and make it easier for investors to invest. 
actually this initiative was launched in 2017 together with uh, the development countries like uh, Pakistan, China. Ambassador Toki Shah worked together with me to participate in this event and the uh, outreaching and the promotion of this initiative. And uh, Ambassador Toki Shah used to say in Geneva many times, trade is investment, investment is trade. And now more than two thirds of the WTO membership are now participating in this negotiation with the target of concluding the text negotiation by the end of next year. And in 2017, when Ambassador Toki Shah and I launched this initiative, we had just a dozen of members of WTO. Now we have 112. One, one of the uh, focal point of this negotiation is the developing countries and LDC's participation in global investment flows and the need for technical assistance and the capacity building. On fishery subsidies, continued efforts are put into negotiation to end harmful fishery subsidies. On trade and environment, many WTO members agree to enhance their engagement to combat climate change, plastic pollution, and the fossil fuel consumption uh, from trade uh, perspective. My third point is about the non-rules aspect of WTO's efforts to help developing countries to cover from the pandemic and develop their economy. Making trade rules is the main, but not the only task of the WTO. WTO has also been doing a lot of work in non-rules related areas. This mainly concerns the inclusiveness goal of international trade. And this pillar, there are several uh, topics members have been working on, including micro, small, and media-sized enterprises, MISMIS, trade and gender, technical assistance and the capacity building, aid for trade initiative, trade for peace, and trade and development. On MISMIS, focused discussions are taking place within an informal working group. Just the last uh, Thursday, the group launched its Trade for MISMIS online platform. The platform includes a series of uh, a short guidance for how to get start to trade for small business. It uh, disseminates information on important topics to improve policymakers' understanding of challenges faced by the small business. It also identifies and promotes good practice in different countries. I strongly encourage the authorities, business people, and uh, other stakeholders to have a look at this platform and make use of the useful information there to promote the recovery and development the mismis in your country. On trade and gender, WTO members recognize that trade can play an important role in driving women's economic empowerment, therefore seek to build a more inclusive trade system that will allow more women to participate in trade and to reap the economic benefit of good trading, of global trading. Currently, WTO is uh, framing and structuring its actions based on four objectives. First, risk awareness on the link between trade and gender. Second, facilitating members' action on trade and gender. Third, generating new data on the impact of trade on women, and the force providing training to government officials and to women entrepreneurs. On technical assistance and capacity building, every year the WTO organizes hundreds of training activities for developing countries to improve their understanding of WTO rules, to improve their capacity to implement those rules and to strengthen their industries and business competitiveness in the international market. During the pandemic, due to the travel restriction, all these activities have been shifted to a virtual format, enabling developing countries to continue to benefit from these activities. Despite our tremendous effort, we know there is still a gap between the WTO's capacity and the growing national demands for such assistance. 
with the belief that uh, teaching one to fish is better than giving him fish. We established the WTO Cheers program and which selected academic institutions are supported by the WTO to do relevant research and network with stakeholders on trade policies, including government officials, private sectors, academia, and provide advice to their national authorities. Recently, we announced the third group of institutions that had been added to the CHAIRS program list, bringing the total of 36. The whole School of Economics of Pakistan is included in the list. Congratulations. WTO has also provided applicants from developing countries with opportunities to work with the Secretariat and the Young Professional Program or various internship program. This program helps developing countries to train officials or business representatives on WTO matters. I was told that several interns now work for their governments on WTO affairs, either as staff or consultants. This is a really very encouraging news. On Trade for Peace, we found that trade can help conflict-affected countries to achieve and maintain peace. We are currently exploring possible initiatives and this topic. One of the efforts we are already doing is to help relevant countries to complete their WTO accession process. The WTO membership requires necessary domestic reforms in line with the WTO rules. This effort would improve a country's governance and uh, reduce the risk of uh, triggering new conflicts. In addition, we are helping developing countries with joining the WTO recently to further integrate into the multilateral trading system. All, this, all those efforts would help a country to reduce its risk of a governance failure and the new conflicts. On trade and the development, in addition to the existing WTO rules on special and differential treatment for developing countries and LDCs, we are synthesizing WTO's efforts with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The development that I mentioned would be taken into consideration in implementation of existing WTO rules and in the shaping of our future rules. So in WTO, members are also continuing consulting on the vaccine-related IP issues. And I think the large developing countries like Pakistan should have its own manufacturing capability of uh, vaccines. In this regard, WTO can play its role. And the, the IP issue, is, this is a very most uh, immediate action that WTO believe that it should and could take to help developing countries recover from the pandemic. We hope that developing countries can take advantage and participate actively in the consultation. There could deliver tangible benefit for developing countries. I would like, I would like to stop here for my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zhang. Our next speaker is again a highly uh, revered expert in her field, uh, Ms. Marion Jensen. Um, and, and the area that we would like to discuss with uh, Ms. Jensen is, um, we see by 2050, 80% of the world will be living in water-stressed areas. By 2030, a billion uh, of middle class would be added, Asian middle class would be added to the market, which means they need, we would need to be fed, they need to be having clothes. The toll it will take on the planet, how does one uh, mitigate the uh, ravishness that is going to come along in this kind of production uh, that is needed for the future? Um, for this, we have Ms. Jansen, she's director and Trade and Agriculture uh, for OECD. Ms. Jansen has been a key member 
uh, in supporting inputs for organizations like G20, G7, APEC, and other relevant international fora. Um, I uh, a warm welcome to you, uh, Ms. Jansen, and I'd request you to please take on from here. Thank you uh, very much for this introduction, introduction, Ms. Fakar, and it's a great pleasure to, for me to be with you uh, today in this event uh, that has been opened by uh, your Federal Commerce Secretary Farouki. It's my pleasure and my honor. And the pleasure side is also very much related to the side that until re to the fact that until recently I've been working for one of the co-organizing organization of this event for the International Trade Center. So very, very happy to be part of this event. As you mentioned, I'm currently the director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at the OECD. Now the OECD is an international organization with 38 member countries and Pakistan is not a member of this organization. Uh, but we nevertheless have um, relatively strong links. We are working in two areas with each other. Um, and I will want, would like to make reference to these two areas, which are the areas of trade facilitation and international tax collaboration. And I would like then, as a third and a fourth point, at the third point, make reference to one of the issues raised by Ambassador Shah, the issue of um, government support and how this affects the level playing field on the, uh, at the international level, and then go into some of the issues you raised, Ms. Fakar, um, how can we manage to feed the world um, in the current context of climate stress and growing world population? But let me start by uh, going back to our membership. I mentioned we have 38 member countries. Uh, many of them are European-based uh, countries, but a, an important number are, um, are American, Northern and Southern American-based countries. Four of our member countries are from the Asia-Pacific region, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and uh, South Korea. Uh, but we are currently uh, engaging more closely, more actively with countries in the Asia-Pacific region uh, with a view on strengthening our partnership with that region. Because as mentioned, was mentioned by one of the speakers before, that region is key to global economic activity and to global trade. Now, to start with the four um, areas that I mentioned, the first one, trade facilitation, several uh, speakers at the beginning made reference to this, to the efforts um, Pakistan has notably made to make border crossings easier uh, for goods that enter or leave the country to facilitate trade at the border. And it's my understanding that some of that work has taken place with the International Trade Center. Now, at the OECD, we uh, host the the International Measure for Trade Facilitation, the Trade Facilitation Index Database, and uh, in uh, the collaboration with the WTO in an MOU, it stipulated that that, um, that information we collect is also used to track, to assess progress of WTO members in the area of trade facilitation. Now, Pakistan is covered by our trade facilitation index. So this is one of the areas where Pakistan works with the OECD. And in line with what we have heard so far, the efforts that have been made by the Pakistani government have led to improvements in that measure in the past years, notably when it comes to areas like advanced rulings, appeal procedures, simplification and harmonization of documents at the border or streamlining procedures. Where more can be done is in the area of optimization, the use of IT at the border. And the importance of IT and optimization has become strikingly visible during this COVID-19 crisis, where it was suddenly increasingly difficult to have people at the border to deal with processes. And it, was, uh, it became very visible how uh, important it was to be able to deal with a lot of the export and import related processes through digital systems. Unfortunately, we are also currently in uh, the context of the supply chain bottlenecks that have been mentioned before, seeing that digitalization, where it has been lacking, is currently very much contributing and, um, and rendering more severe the bottlenecks that we are seeing in ports. And unfortunately, this is notably the case in some of our member countries, where digitalization in the port infrastructure has not progressed enough. 
So digitalization, definitely an area to continue to look forward to. The second area that I mentioned where Pakistan has been in contact, um, uh, working a lot with uh, the OECD on is the area of taxation. Some of you may have heard that the OECD has recently struck a major global uh, tax deal that has 136 member countries. The Pakistan has not uh, become a member of this deal yet, even though so our numbers, our analysis suggests that Pakistan could uh, gain um, a yearly amount of 150 million US dollars um, per year in tax receipts if it were to join. Now, why is this tax deal relevant for a building back better agenda? Well, it's relevant for the building back because the building back involves in many countries government support and the government actively helping to build back. Now, um, that building back for this, you require money, so government revenue. And it also it is also important for the better. As the director of trade at OECD, I am convinced that our global tax deal is key to ensure that trade and the benefits of trade are distributed more equally and that it's not only the big players that win, as uh, some of the speakers before have suggested. Our global tax deal ensures that also multinational companies pay their fair share in global tax revenues and therefore help governments to redistribute the gains from trade from the big players to the smaller players and to make sure that bigger parts of the populations can take advantage of international trade deals. Now, these are the two areas in which uh, we have a relatively strong collaboration, because even so Pakistan has not joined the tax deal, there has been a very important collaboration with our center of tax policies over the past years and the stronger and intensified relationships. I promise to add two additional points um, in this discussion. Once the first one was that I would I wanted to make reference to the role of government support. We also often refer to it as a subsidy agenda and the level playing field. And uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, Ambassador Shah who made reference to the discrepancies in how much money um, industrialized countries have been able to put into the stimulus packages for the economy uh, during COVID-19 compared to other countries. Now at the OECD, we have a very extensive agenda um, on subsidies or are sometimes called government support. We have for years been collecting information on government support in agriculture and published that information in a document called the Agricultural Monitoring and Evaluation Report. We have for years been uh, collecting information on government support in the fisheries sector and published that information um, in the context of our fisheries reviews. Both documents, both uh, conceptual uh, frameworks and both data sets, data sets are regularly used by negotiators at the WTO to support them in their negotiations at the WTO on agricultural support or as, as now in the ongoing fish, uh, discussions on fishery subsidies. We also have a major global data uh, set on fossil fuel subsidies and uh, we are working on developing concepts and data on industrial subsidies. We have so far been doing this mainly with a, um, with a focus on how does this type of government affect the level playing field at the global level. And therefore this work is very relevant for the kind of competitiveness com concepts that Ambassador Shah mentioned. But we also have at the OECD an important agenda in the area of competition policy. And, and there, our colleagues look at how does that government support distort competition within a country? Now, increasingly at the OECD, we work together across directorates. And in this case, the Trade and Agriculture Directorate works with the director looking at competition policy to understand how government support more broadly in the own country and at the global level affects competition. And we have notably recently done this when in, in, a, in a paper that looks at uh, government support for the COVID-19 crisis. So I invite you all to look at that paper. It's a short paper where you can find numbers on how much stimulus has gone into countries, into the economies, 
and what the kind of concerns are governments may want to have about that uh, about uh, that kind of support when they think of the recovery and when they think of unwinding it in terms of how the level playing field in countries but also at the global level is affected and we hope that this kind of work will inform governments as they think about how to move out of hopefully out of this COVID-19 crisis into a healthy recovery phase and to build back to build back better. Last but not least, I would like to make reference to the point uh, raised by you, Ms. Fakhar. Uh, what can we do in this context? What should be our concerns and how can we help to ensure that notwithstanding the very recent crisis, uh, we manage to uh, build back better also in terms of ensuring access to food for a wider and growing population. In this area, we have under the agricultural divisions that I'm leading, a very broad-based uh, type of work where we are currently looking at immediate concerns, but also in parallel looking at the medium and longer uh, term uh, concerns that the food systems may be, uh, may be facing. In the short term, we are closely watching prices. Some of you may have heard, may be aware of the recent increases in major commodity prices, not all of them, but several commodities have been hitting very high levels of, of prices, sometimes reaching those of the great financial crisis of 10 years ago. That crisis, you may remember, was sometimes called the food, fuel, and finance crisis. Now, we watch prices, but not only prices. You will be able to find on a, a platform that was built by a number of international agencies together, it includes the OECD, that platform is called the Agricultural Market Information System. On that platform, you will find information on prices of major commodities, uh, agricultural commodities, but you will also find information on stocks, on trade, on how the harvest is evolving. And this tool, which is a pure transparency tool, has proven to be very effective during the COVID-19 crisis, at least in the initial phases, to contribute to stabilizing markets. When governments start to be concerned about the crisis, about a potential lack of access to food, when certain governments were considering to put in place export restrictions for food, and some were actually doing it, we could argue, wait a minute, on the food side, there's currently no problem. There are enough stocks. The harvests have been good. If we stay calm and let the markets flow, everybody will have access to food. And if you look at the data, you will see that in 2020, food prices remain stable. That said, uh, the evolution has been different in recent months, partly because of some of the bottlenecks mentioned before, but also because of changes in policy and changes in harvests. We continue to watch this closely as we enter into the recovery phase, but do not neglect to look at the more longer term challenges that have been mentioned by Ms. Fakar. How to feed a, a globally growing population um, in the current context and how to do this in a context where the climate change may not make things easier, but maybe even make it worse. In this area, we have been working under an umbrella that we call the food systems work. We have published a major publication ahead of the UN Food Systems Summit on how to ensure that food systems meet what we call the triple challenge. Ensure livelihoods for those working in agriculture, provide access to food for growing world population, and to do all this in a manner that is environmentally sustainable. This is not easy because it requires that governments look at three policy objectives. One is economic, one is social, and one is environmental, that they look at these three policy objectives at the same time. One of the advantages we have at the OECD that through, is that through our different committees, we can work on all these three challenges together. We reach out to the ministries responsible for social policies through our social committees. We reach out to the ministries uh, responsible for trade through the trade committee, and we reach out to ministries responsible for agriculture and ministries responsible for environment through the relevant committees. Because of this, 
I strongly believe in uh, the potential that the OECD has in helping governments to drive an interdisciplinary agenda, an agenda that makes environmental, social, and economic policies coherent. And I strongly believe that this is important in order for us to build back better together. In all our work under my directorate, we work closely with the World Trade Organization because we see ourselves as a supporter of the multilateral trading system and as a bridge builder from consensus among our countries, our member countries, towards a broader multilateral consensus, ideally under the WTO. We look forward to continue that collaboration with Didi Zhichang and his colleagues. We look forward to continue to be engaged in our discourse with ITC, and we hope to strengthen our existing collaboration with Pakistan. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Just a polite reminder, please, if you can stick to uh, uh, 10 minutes, uh, the, the time, the paucity of time is now showing up. Um, our next speaker, uh, uh, a very uh, respectable bureaucrat, um, she's been uh, ranked as the top five women reformers by the, by the World Bank uh, for making it easier to do business around the world. Uh, Ms. Farina Mazza, Federal Secretary of Board of Investment. She's held several uh, positions in government ranks at the FBR, at PEMRA and others. Over to you, Farina. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank... Uh... ITC and SDPI for making me a part of this event today. And uh, the topic that I was given to speak on is how inclusive investment policies can enhance competitiveness of women businesses. But I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to let you know that uh, Pakistan has been working a lot uh, in uh, collaboration with other government and international departments to improve the investment regime in the country. Um, primarily, the Board of Investment has been mandated just to promote and facilitate investments, all both local and international. But uh, we've been doing a lot more than just facilitation. Uh, recently, we've been working on the regulatory side of businesses in developing a very friendly ecosystem uh, Pakistan improved 39 positions in the ease of doing business report of the World Bank. Uh, unfortunately, the report has been discontinued. Otherwise, we would have shown further improvement. But uh, the Prime Minister has asked us to continue working on all the 10 indicators that we were working on earlier and not just limit ourselves to the two cities of Lahore and Karachi, which were being mapped by the bank in the report, uh, but also to work on, on other major cities and also other uh, provinces. So it's now all of Pakistan, including all the federating units, um, GP and uh, Kashmir as well. So we are working with very close groups and trying to make doing business easy in Pakistan. Uh, in my interaction with investors, this is the prime most request. They are not asking for tax incentives or any other favors. What they want is their ease. So they could, you know, just uh, uh, buy land. They could register their business, form a company. They could get construction permits on time, get electricity connections on time get the res disputes resolved in time and, you know, wind up a business easily in case if they have to leave. So uh, we've made several laws which now are friendlier than before and uh, which now facilitate the businesses. And for, you know, we can now claim that you can form a company in the country with, you know, just one day, the, the measured time is four hours, but I would say even if we can do it in one day, that's commendable. Uh, we've trying to automate processes, do away with the old obsolete regulations, modernize the ones that can be modernized and totally eliminate the ones that are not needed. 
so uh, pakistan is uh, inshallah going to be a great success in terms of uh, doing business in the coming few years this is a good news i wanted to share uh, coming to the sme sector which is the engine for growth uh, and for the investments also uh, the under the leadership of the prime minister there's a meeting every month where we bring cases in collaboration with different business houses with business associations the real problems that uh, need to be addressed and have to be modified so we've done around 70 regulations re regulatory reforms in the last 5 6 months and are working on many so we've uh, we're working with the pakistan business council with oiccci other chambers uh, the pharmaceutical industry the textile units and all of them who are giving us good feedback so one of the major reform is the harmonization of the food standards which has now been made which which was a demand for coming from the food sector investors for a very long time and now they're very happy uh, in that so um, a lot of time was being consumed by the security agencies and giving clearances for visa entrance and other regulations if you were a director in a company you had yourself uh, uh, you know you had your security test uh, done but then again if you become a director in another company you would have had to uh, uh, sort of have that uh, security clearance again from the agencies so this requirement has been done away with and now the many of the foreign nationals they can come to the country and also the limit for the security agencies has been set for six weeks so in case if we do not hear from them we grant them visa work permit uh, business visas so that they can come and do a lot of work here. Also, we've made the special economic zones functional. Uh, the law was passed in 2012, but these zones have primarily not been operational and were a center for just real estate activities. But a slight modification was made in the law in 2016. And now uh, we have made the entire process of filing the application uh digitized you can only apply online and uh the you have to start your construction within six months and come into production within two years so if you do not do that your plot will get cancelled and since it is all digitized so there is very uh, little chance of any manipulation in this context also we are trying to make other uh you know uh, we have the bilateral investment treaties with around 32 countries at the moment the these are very old treaties and are uh, the template needed revision so we had this approval from the cabinet and now we are renegotiating uh, our investment treaties and modernizing them and we are trying to make sure that the investor is facilitated we are creating uh, an investment ombudsman's office so that they do not have to go to international arbitration uh, to get their uh, cases resolved but the first uh, resolution point is within the country um, so uh, i would say the board of investment is very actively unfortunately because of covid we couldn't go out and do the promotional work much but i had i think uh, over 100 webinars in the last couple of years and uh, but it's not easy you know getting investments in the country is a whole of the government approach it's not, not just going to be there because of the board of investment you have to make friendly policies and then you have to make them sustainable the policies should not be changed very frequently this is another demand coming from the investors you give tax breaks uh, tax reductions one year and then you change the policy in another year the security environment has improved uh, greatly also the power shortage has been overcome so uh, we are inviting businesses in pakistan there's a lot of interest uh, unfortunately uh, you know a lot of companies are since they were still making profits in pakistan they are now lending to their other subsidiary companies outside pakistan so there is a lot of outflow of investments going on we are not short on inflows we we did show a three percent increase uh, till in the last three months of the current year but 
we are uh, having problems in terms of outflows. So I'll now come to my main topic. I'm sorry, I'm, I'll try to be very short now. So uh, with the world economy still struggling to recover from the economic shocks of the past four years, momentum is growing for a new industrial revolution that is both sustainable and inclusive. This means supporting growth within the constraints of the planet's limited resources and putting people at the heart of the development. Central to inclusive and sustainable industrial development is the urgent need to harness the economic potential of women, half of the world's population. An ILO report estimates that by 2022, 900 million women who have been living or contributing at a subsistence level will enter the economic mainstream for the first time as producers, consumers, employees, and entrepreneurs. The economic impact is expected to be staggering with profound effects on global development as a whole. It is an established fact that inclusive investment policies enhance the competitiveness of women businesses all across the globe. It is becoming increasingly clear that women are and will continue to be powerful drivers for development. When men and women become more equal, economies grow faster, fewer people remain in poverty, and overall well-being of the human race increases. Foreign direct investment can generally lead to economic growth as well as provide revenues for the country that can be used for development financing. To encourage foreign direct investment, government intervention is required in order to establish an enabling and conducive investment climate. Governments need to pay attention to the rules and regulations, including the legal frameworks, stipulating the minimum wage and standard working conditions. This can range from the protection of private property rights to labor laws. Also to be put in place are social safety nets that protect the society's most vulnerable. Moreover, environmental standards are important to ensure that companies operate and use resources in a sustainable manner. Both the public and private sectors have a role to play in making the foreign direct investment inclusive. On one hand, governments can secure policies that channel FDI to support marginalized groups, place limitations on damaging business activities, and use increased revenues to provide redistributive social benefits. On the other hand, businesses can provide overall employment and training while also providing direct benefits to disadvantaged groups. FDI. Serena, if I may, please. A shortage of time, please. Okay. A little, another minute or so, and we can, yeah, yeah, my apologies. Yeah. So, uh, some challenges of women for the economic empowerment that need to be addressed include lack of access to support networks, issues relating to gender or cultural acceptance, lack of basic education, lack of technical skill and knowledge about business, lack of market knowledge. So uh, what I wanted to highlight was uh, none of the government policies discriminates negatively women in any of the, its economic policies. Uh, it's the societal norms that the women have to uh, face, which discourages them to come to the mainstream and also take entrepreneurial activities. The government is supporting uh, women through the BISP program. It is also uh, making it easier to finance women in different fields. The state bank is going to give uh, loans to 0% to the institutions will be, which will be giving loans to women at less than 5% rate. So uh, it's uh, an all out effort. It's not going to be done overnight. It, it has to be a continued effort, both from the government and the uh, private sector. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marina. Um, our next speaker, Mr. Mike Nithavrianikis. Um, we would request uh, Mr. Mike to take the podium and if please you could highlight how can our trade partners, our donors support us in an inclusive uh, growth in our economy. Thank you. Huma, thank you very much. And I've decided to stand up because I can't yeah. sit down for any longer. I'm fidgeting a lot and I've, <laughs> I've eaten all of the sweeties that were provided as well. So I need to move away from the candy, but I'm really happy to be here in such a distinguished panel of, you know, OECD and WTO and the Ministry of Trade and Commerce, Ministry of Board Investment, and obviously our, our partners and hosts, uh, STPI and International Trade Centre. And I'm really 
you know, thrilled to be with a panel that has mentioned so many of the points that were in my speech. So that will save you listening to me for the next two hours. And I will try and um, bring my remarks into just a, a, a few short points. I mean, the topic for the discussion is clearly a, a very timely one. And I think we stand here um, hosted by Pakistan as a country that thinks they have a very warm, productive trade and investment relationship, but it is not anywhere ne near reaching its potential. And uh, I think that that's irrespective of the challenges of the, the COVID uh, pandemic. And I, and I think that we recognize that the ingredients are in place to turn our partnership, what was very much focused on being an aid donor to a development partner. So one based on kind of mutual priorities. And I think there is um, you know, a lot that we can be proud of that is already in place, but much, much more uh, to do. And, and how we build back better is as important to our government as it is to, to Pakistan's and, and to the system here. So let me say a word about what we're doing to sort of partner Pakistan in this uh, space and how important it is for, for Pakistan's economic transformation. Um, the, the debate about competitiveness and openness you know, is a really important one because I think as has been discussed this afternoon, um, we're in the, one of the most unconnected trading regions in the world. And even within that region, Pakistan is um, performing below par. So we all know that it's encouraging that Pakistan is exporting more this financial year than in previous ones. And actually, I was at a Pakistan Business Council event where um, the chairman, Saqib Shirazi of Atlas Group, was saying that he had doubted some of the suggestions that Pakistan could export more than $25 billion or $28 billion worth of, of goods uh, a year. And it's going to beat that figure, I think, very comfortably uh, this year. But we all know that Pakistan is importing more than it, it wants to. And we also know that um, Pakistan's uh, kind of composition of exports is too heavily focused in textiles. Now, that's all right for our country because we import a lot of textiles from Pakistan and it is a very strong sector that um, Pakistan deserves credit for and should be proud at. Um, but we recognise, I think, that the importance of diversifying across sectors and as somebody who has lived in this country for two and a half years who can't understand why he can't buy Pakistani mangoes easily or dates or figs or honey. I think, um, you know, we could add to that list pharmaceutical project uh, products, um, healthcare manufactured items, other agri-tech products. I know that Mr. Faruqi and the Ministry of Trade and Commerce, Mr. Razak Daud, are completely seized of this. And we are very supportive about trying to turn the UK into an easier destination for those products. And I suspect there are many other countries in the world that would benefit enormously from that. And, and I think one of the things that we are discussing on a bilateral basis is how do we make each other's countries more open and easier to access for our exporting um, companies. The sustainable economic growth is going to really depend on, on Pakistan, I think, tackling some of those long-standing problems and, and becoming uh, more outward looking and, and innovative and, and then further integrated into the global economy. We all know what a huge uptick in growth there would be if there was easier trade with Afghanistan, with India. It's really encouraging to hear about the, the uh, recent moves into Uzbekistan and the Central Asian republics, because I think that will be a huge benefit. And if you look at, I, I'm based in Karachi, you look at Karachi with Port Qasim, Karachi Port Trust, and further along the coast, uh, Gwadar, you know, those are the entry points into Pakistan and out of Pakistan into, you know, the wider Middle East uh, region, which I think is, is another area that could see very significant growth. Through our um, kind of bilateral trade programming as development partners, we, we think we can address and supplement some of the work that government is doing to fill those capacity gaps and our remit trade program that um, the uh, Honourable Commerce Secretary referred to uh, with the ITC um, and the work that we're doing with the Ministry of Commerce and TDAP and, and on the strategic um, uh, trade policy framework uh, by developing a national priority export sector strategy with a focus on, on these non-traditional sectors, some of which I mentioned, is an area that we are, are very excited about. And through our ITC programme, we're building 
the capacity of female entrepreneurs, it's actually quite nice to talk to an audience where there is a reasonable gender balance, because too often in Pakistan, you're speaking in a room that is mainly male and very often a panel that is entirely male. So I'm quite encouraged to, to see that, although I came from the Pakistan Business Council when our, our High Commissioner called out PBC that there were, I think, 55 people in the room and only five of them were women. So there is still some way to go as people move up into more senior positions in, in companies. But anyway, the, the, you know, the gender balance is just one illustration of that. If you are not maximizing the potential of 50% of your population, then you're not going to nearly reach your, uh, reach your potential uh, in terms of the, the trade and investment relationship. Um, and we, we think that um, tariff policy is an area that it deserves um, much attention. I mean, obviously, uh, investors want predictability. Um, they want this to be sustained. Uh, the UK is looking at doing more and through our UK export finance, through our development finance institution, the Commonwealth Development Corporation, which in fact our foreign minister um, has recently announced is changing its name to British Investment International. And we think that that is going to increase the pipeline of investment flows into Pakistan. It's not another Belt and Road initiative. It's, it's not trying to take over what CPEC is doing. It's trying to give alternative business people an opportunity to, to leverage and harness uh, new sources of funding, particularly in areas that, that Pakistan is seized of in terms of focusing on um, sectors where we think there are particular strengths in healthcare, education, and, and particularly the, the transition to clean growth and so clean infrastructure, where obviously the COP26 outcome um, still is very much fresh in, in people's minds. I think that um, the you know development partners like us op occupy a, a, a unique position. You know, we are the third largest destination for Pakistan's exports. We are the third largest investor in Pakistan, but we think that that has the opportunity to be really uh, turbocharged. And, you know, my role here, for example, I am a, a career diplomat, but I straddle both my foreign ministry and trade ministry. So I am Deputy High Commissioner in Karachi with responsibility for our government's relations with the provinces of Sindh and Baluchistan, but I'm also trade director for all of Pakistan. And actually I'm trade commissioner for some other countries in the region like Jordan, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I have now responsibility for some of the economic development programs that we are uh, working on, including uh, Remit, as well as some of the other work that we are doing with the Ministry of Commerce, the Federal Board of Revenue, which I, I was at the Federal Board of Revenue before I came here, and I was at the Board of Investment on Monday. And I really feel that there is a meeting of minds about the the mutual prosperity that can flow if we can really um, tackle some of these issues. I think the, the from my perspective, it's not um, the policy process, the policy expertise is there, it's the implementation, and I think it's the kind of sustainability of, of all of those things that we, we all, it's incumbent on all of us to get that um, right. And I think if we can tackle some of those barriers, and I don't mean to imply that Pakistan is the only country with trade barriers. When I talk to the Pakistan system, they will tell us that the UK needs to address some of the barriers that might prevent, particularly post our departure from the European Union, that might prevent more trade happening into the United Kingdom. So I think there is a way of doing this in a, in a mutually reinforced uh, way. So through our trade programming, we've developed, uh, I think, a momentum both at provincial and federal level, very important to focus on the business environment reform. And I'm really encouraged to hear what the Secretary of Border and Investment said, because we were, honestly, we were as excited as you were about Pakistan moving from 136 to 108, and we were ready to celebrate a big leap into the top 100. And then suddenly, the ease of doing business report was discontinued. But I'm really happy to hear that some of those key uh, criteria are still being worked hard upon. So I think that is very encouraging uh, indeed. And we are also, you know, particularly focused, I think, on some of the, the pricing and regulatory issues. I spend a lot of my time in Pakistan supporting existing British companies that are facing challenges in terms of fairness and transparency. And that's you know, that's all right in one sense, because but they know the system. They have been here in many cases for decades and in some cases pre-independence. But if they can't 
get um, the right sort of predictability, then we're going to find it a struggle to bring new companies into the market. And I think that's something we need to spend a lot of uh, time on. Obviously, COVID has really disrupted things. I mean, I agree with um, Secretary Investment that um, I, I too am uh, fed up of doing virtual webinars and I'm happy to be in Islamabad for the first time in 10 months doing an event, although it's obviously a great pleasure to be connected with people in uh, Geneva and other parts of the world um, to speak virtually. But I hope we can return quite soon to in-person events, but particularly when we're talking about trade and investment, there aren't many business people in the world who will sign a deal on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. So we need to, I think, get to get some of that in-person activity moving, Omicron permitting. So let me just finish by saying um, that we think development partners can contribute a lot. L let me be very clear, this is not done in a, a hectoring, lecturing type of way. We can learn a huge amount from a system like Pakistan that is you know, grappling with these issues. And, and as the UK, in some cases, sets its own policy post um, Brexit, we are learning a lot from working with um, you know, committed bureaucrats and, and others like them. And I think we are hopefully finding a way to empower voices from all segments of society, because it's only in doing that that we will, I think, really be able to unleash the, the true potential of Pakistan. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, and thank you for appreciating STPI for the gender sensitiveness. And I'd also like to say, uh, Mike, is one of the most engaged uh, diplomat. And not only that, everyone knows he's been uh, very, very engaged in our trade uh, support programs. And thank you for more recently, he ran a marathon in UK to raise funds for Pakistan uh, Organization for Education. So thank you very much for that. Coming to our last uh, panelists, um, Dr. Mohammed Saeed. Um, Dr. Saab is a senior advisor, trade facilitation uh, and, at uh, International Trade Center. Um, I'd also like to say Dr. Saab has been very instrumental uh, at the WTO uh, some years back in, in several trade facilitation uh, uh, pro uh, support programs, probably around 50 countries, developing countries on the on, uh, around the world he's been supporting. And he's also been supporting trade facilitation at the UNCTAD. And Dr. Saab, our question is with 40% higher utility rate in the region, how do you think our SMEs will be able to compete? What can we do for them? And what is your way forward uh, that you'd like to propose? Over to you, Doxa. You're on mute, Doxa. You're on mute. If you could please unmute. Is it okay? Can, uh, am I audible? No, you are. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good day from Chile and wet Geneva, and thank Soma for your kind words of introduction. Uh, I wish I would have been there in person, but unfortunately, um, ITC cancelled all official travel, so I'm missing the beautiful sunny December of Islamabad. Uh, as you know, the International Trade Center is dedicated to supporting the competitiveness, micro, small, and medium enterprises in the Geneva community, and you must have heard Ambassador Zhang, we call them Miss me. Uh, the pandemic has, uh, I would say, a harmful impact on production and employment, signifying one thing, that there is a great extent of dependencies between sectors and the depth of the international integration. Unfortunately, COVID-19 pandemic hit and hurt everyone, but it has hit the most vulnerable the hardest, and that is the MISBs who are backbone of economies like Pakistan. And it has been worse impact on them, probably because of their exposure to inflexible supply chains and also their limited liquidity. But while they are facing these kind of, I would say, less because of less inbuilt resilience, there are certain SMEs uh, who have the potential to be more nimble, I would say, and more innovative than uh, larger companies. Uh, ITC in this context carried out a global survey and then the two project GRASP and REMIT, which we are currently implementing, one funded by EU and one funded by FCDO. 
uh, about the Pakistan SMEs, their impact of COVID on them. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the numbers, but uh, let me share with you some key takeaways or key findings. IDC Global Surveys showed that two thirds of SMEs have been strongly impacted by the pandemic. In Pakistan, this percentage is 92%. And top issues reported by the firms included delayed client payments, reduced logistics, and absentee employees. 72% of the firms reported a reduction in their revenue, with four out of five saying that the reduction has been from somewhere 20 to 50%. 52% of the firms reported that they are exporting less than normal, 7% stopped exporting, and 11% reported that they were exporting more than the normal. And I think this is what, Huma, you were pointing out when you were introducing the subject, that there has been certain sectors and certain companies which have been uh, increased their exports. But before I come to the three thematic key areas which I think can help SMEs in countries like Pakistan, uh, let me make uh, one point that whatever the policy initiative or options has to be to combat the challenges of COVID, it has to be comprehensive and collaborative. What I mean from being comprehensive, the, it is that it is not only the responsibility of the government. It has to be concerted efforts by the government, the business support association uh, organizations like TDAP, different chambers, you mentioned Pakistan Business Council and overseas investor chambers and others, and the businesses themselves. In this context, uh, I would say uh, ITC came up with a 15 point action plan for the government, for the businesses, as well as for the BSOs. And that project was headed by um, a person you just heard from wearing the hat of uh, OECD. Uh, thank you, Marianne, for that. Uh, government across the world has implemented different combination of policy options and support measures over the almost last two years. We have no significant success stories to align our sport. I will pick three areas. And my first pick is that digitalization is key to Miss B's recovery. Uh, thank God the technology is not only the biggest enabler, but also the biggest provider of the solutions. Better connectivity and online presence is necessary to keep up with the changing market trends due to COVID-19. The digitalization is changing the way MISMEs do business. That's how we see a tremendous growth in the e-commerce during the time of the pandemic. The pandemic has also accelerated the digital transformation, some say by as many as seven years. And these changes are expected to be long lasting as companies are investing in the digital technologies. And these are irreversible changes. So SMEs to keep up their competitiveness in this rapidly digitalizing business world, uh, there has to be response to encourage innovation from a regulatory perspective also. And this new dynamic environment requires all stakeholders being more strategic and inclusive than ever as to ensure that leaving anyone behind across or within the countries. There is a need to create a culture of e-governance where data saved in a computer is equally credible as a paper stored in an official records. We need to learn to respect the power of data. Pakistan has the state of art system of Nadra, which was successfully used for targeted uh, interventions by the NCOC. Pakistan need to replicate the same approach with same spirit for its policy formulation and economic recovery. Those who would begin to upgrade now, whether it is businesses or government, will be able to test this economic model and again a head start over their competitors. The second area uh, which is necessary in my view for the make, um, Miss Me's recovery is that make doing business easier. And we heard a lot uh, from my fellow panelists on this, 
because this rapid digitalization, and especially for the cross-border uh, trade, uh, brings challenges in logistics, information and data management, tariff duties and taxation, as well as the regulatory compliance. So only a technological advanced, collaborative, and transparent model of e-governance. When I'm saying this, it practically means a shift from physical to digital control of compliance. And that is uh, what is required. Uh, here, I think Pakistan has done a lot. We heard from Secretary uh, Investment, uh, who led this initiative uh, on uh, ease of doing business, and uh, thank to Farina for leading this from the front. In this context, I also want to mention uh, that Pakistan Custom is already processing all its border transactions digitally. Electronic customs is necessary, but not sufficient. It must be supported with e-ports, AI for risk management, and techniques of inspection and surveillance through technology. Targeted instruments like e-payment, e-logistics, e-permits, and geofencing can uh, be conducive for the business environment. Uh, the single window uh, initiative of Pakistan was mentioned, which is led by the customs. Uh, it needs to be make this initiative more robust, sustainable, and roll out to cover all cross-border transactions on all entry and exit points. The third and the last area which I think needs to be done, and there are also, I think, many of my fellow panelists, including Homa, mentioned, and that is about the skill building. When we were doing these surveys, 59% of the respondent firms reported that there was low to average availability of skilled workers for hire. 91% of the firms reported that they provide specific training to their employees to match their company's need. Smaller firms do not have that luxury, and so they are at the disadvantage because they, they cannot spare their resources to train. Uh, then uh, it comes to <clears throat> Uh, the government and other civil society and the organization. And Pakistan needs to devise a short, medium, and long-term plan to build the skill set of its workforce to adapt to this economic system, uh, which is more based on the digital processes and requires reliability of the supply chain. Workers with the right skills set are better equipped to find solutions to new problems. To remain competitive, business will have to adapt and adjust. The government will have to support the economic well-being of MSMEs by upscaling their skills and making them more resilient and sustainable. When developing support policies for small businesses, government have a duty to address the need of the vulnerable sector of the population, which means the women, youth, and minorities. As such, it is important to undertake more direct engagement with the businesses in particular with those type of business that will be critical to the future growth, and that is uh, MISMIS. My parting message is that reform process must be inclusive, which means it must include the perspective of the private sector and especially the MISMIS, because for their smaller resources capacity, they suffer the most. Such policies are the most impactful when the voices of all stakeholders are affected in the policy formulation and the implementation. I'll stop here and thank you very much for inviting me to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc Saab. Indeed, uh, filling the skills gap is critical to any kind of growth. Um, I'd, I'd like to request our panelists uh, for just a one-liner uh, policy recommendation before we can go to um, Mr. Vakar's closing remarks. Um, Mr. Mike, if we could begin with you, please. I, I won't be so presumptuous to tell um, policy owners what I think they should be uh, doing because they know exactly what they intend doing. But I would focus very hard on the um, the tax predictability. I think that would be the single biggest issue that is very difficult for any investors or any companies thinking in the medium and long term. And let's, put, let's face it, Pakistan is always going to be a country where companies want to come in and stay, not just come and do one contract and leave to go somewhere else. So the tax regime is critical. 
Thank you very much. Very important advice, Ms. Farina. Yeah, uh, you know, tax is one of the major impediments which businesses always keep complaining about. But my uh, focus would be on all policies. I would suggest if the government takes a policy decision, it should stick to it, at least in for the short term, so that businesses are able to develop a plan, to bring in investments and get the results which they are aiming for. Yeah. Consistency. Thank you yes. so much. Dr. Said, would you like to conclude, please? Uh, uh, thank a you. one minor recommendation, please. Yes. Thank you, Ma. Uh, let me repeat. It says no taxation without representation. And I would say no policy without involvement of the private sector. Thank you. Right. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ms. Maria, if you could come to you, please. Well, so much has been said about taxes, so let me reiterate the invitation that our director for the Center of Tax Policy has made for predictable tax policies. Uh, for, feel free to reach out to us again, and uh, the doors are always open for Pakistan to become a member. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we still have Ambassador Zang, or he's not there anymore? Um, Secretary Saab, can we come to yourself, please? I would say that uh, now we have this framework, which is, uh, we believe, is a quite an inclusive framework in the shape of uh, strategic trade policy, uh, SDPF. And uh, now the challenge is uh, the implementation of that framework and an and inclusive implementation of framework. So I believe that is the main challenge. And here I would like to, you know, just uh, appeal to our stakeholders and partners to support uh, us. There, some of them are already supporting us for for a very inclusive sort of uh, uh, implementation. You hit it on the nail, uh, Faruqi Saab. Implementation is the word. Uh, can we have Dr. Taki to please kindly? Thank you. Uh, since uh, gender inclusiveness was mentioned uh, a lot, and I was just sharing with Secretary Saab, and it will be my suggestion to SDPI. Uh, in Geneva, we launched an initiative which was called Geneva Gender Champions. So I think we need to have a Pakistan Gender Champions. Excellent. And it was predominantly men. And uh, we made certain pledges. And one of the pledge was that uh, those ambassadors who made that pledge, they would not go to a gender blind panel. Politely regret it. And it overnight changed. There were always women in panels. Excellent. And secondly, they made certain institutional and personal pledges also. Uh, I think it's high time that uh, maybe SDPI considers launching yeah. Pakistan Absolutely. Gender Champion with the uh, involvement of all stakeholders, predominantly government. Thank you. Super. Uh, Dr. Saab, it's very heartening to listen to your suggestion. Thank you very much. Before we go to the concluding remarks by Dr. Vakar, we can take just one question from the audience, if there's any. No, yeah. <laughs> um, so I request uh, Dr. Vakar Ahmed, Joint Executive Director of SDPI to kindly uh, extend his con con concluding remarks. Dr. Vakar is an economist, a public finance uh, management expert. His book was recently launched, Pakistan's Agenda for Economic Reform, and he's advised several ministries. Uh, he's a PhD from National University of Ireland in Galway. Vakar, please. Thank you very much. Let me start by thanking you, first of all, really, for moderating this high-level uh, uh, plenary today. Thank and you. Let me uh, thank by start, uh, starting with uh, Maik, uh, Farina Saiba, um, Secretary Commerce Saleh Saab, and uh, Dr. Taukir Saab for their leadership, and, uh, of course, Dr. Taukir's team as well for bringing uh, this session, very important session, to STPI's conference, where, of course, uh, the, the, the aim is to really uh, come back to some semblance of uh, uh, pre-COVID or normalcy uh, and really start meeting in person the way we used to and convene meetings uh, as much as is possible. Uh, and I think uh, STPI has been partners with uh, the UK Aid and ITC uh, for the past 30 years now in sort of uh, connecting the research policy linkages, which is what we can continue uh, and, and the advice from Doc, Dr. Talkie is very well received. I think we have had three very committed civil servants today right here in the panel. We, in fact, uh, look up to them. They are Pakistan's best. They are Pakistan's hope, you know. 
and whatever they have mentioned today, I think uh, this is not just words. Uh, their, their actions are actually uh, speaking in the form of results, uh, wherein, of course, you're now seeing the highest level of uh, exports therein. You have seen investment come in in very dif difficult times, uh, even amid COVID. Uh, there wasn't a dry out of investments. Really happy to see that. But most important of all, the startup revolution in this country, which is being noticed, uh, and we are not saying this, this is what international community is, is, is talking about, you know. I, I, I now work more with government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and the freelancing industry uh, has been picked up in KP by Forbes magazine, by Bloomberg, by others who are all there in Peshawar, trying to understand what are those variables which are really uh, getting all these startups up there, you know. So really uh, happy to see them. Uh, and, and with these three very committed uh, civil servants, we've had three very committed partners whom we have heard today, you know, uh, really grateful to, 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 to all of them. I think in my very uh, sort of one, one minute closing, you know, I think two or three things which STPI would continue to do with ITC and UK and other development partners, particularly under the guidance of uh, Ministry of Commerce, BOI and other ministries. One is to take the provinces along because the kind of thought leadership that we have seen in today's panel or what we see in the federal government that now has to go down into the provincial governments and, and really below that as well. And, uh, and, and I, I, I say so because one of the important issues is not about reform for SMEs, it's about voice of SMEs. So the voice of those micro and small segment of SMEs has to really reach those policy corridors, which brings me to my second point. My second point is how do we help these SMEs to organize themselves, to actually ask uh, in a very succinct manner what they are demanding. They are even unable to, in fact, communicate with the government in that succinct manner, you know. And, and you can just, just pinpoint small chamber businesses on your finger, fingertips. We have very few, and none of them have research wings of their own. So that's the second area where one needs to sort of build capacity of small business associations. Uh, a third, I think, un until the time local governments take root, it is the civil service which is really holding the system together. And perhaps local civil servants would have to, local level administrators would have to take a lead in really identifying the local level challenges, which, for example, in those areas where policy help is not reaching, like, for example, the newly merged districts in KP or Blochistan or in Tirasen, it, it'll perhaps fall on that, that, that local level civil service to really come up with proposals and connect with the thought leadership here in, in their ministries and communicate uh, to... 